A Nigerian jet bombs a refugee camp in a Boko Haram attack. More political turmoil in Gambia as legislators vote to extend President Yahya Jammeh's term by three months. And a special tour through Washington, D.C.'s National Museum of African American History and Culture. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. It has been a day of terror in the West African nation of Mali. At least 50 people, including five suicide bombers, were killed when a vehicle packed with explosives was detonated inside a military camp in the northern Mali city of Gao on Wednesday. Government officials say the attack, which happened near the super camp of the United Nations, claimed the lives of UN peacekeepers from multiple countries. The camp was home to government soldiers and members of various rival armed groups which are jointly patrolling Mali's restive uh, northern region in line with a UN brokered peace accord. Witnesses say it appears the attackers attempted to target the Joint Operations Center located in the north of the camp, but the bomb was triggered outside before they could enter the camp. Officials say the death toll may rise. While well, still in West Africa, a Nigerian military airstrike killed more than 50 people on Tuesday in what officials are calling an accidental bombing during operations that were targeting the Boko Haram terrorist group. The military initially says, uh, said the airstrike in run hit a camp for people internally displaced by Boko Haram. The presidential spokesman Femi Edesina told VOA it struck a civilian area. Edesina says there has been some Boko Haram activities nearby. President Mohamedou Buhari promised support for the victims in a statement on his official Twitter account. The aid group Doctors Without Borders says the death toll stands at 52 in a statement released in the hours after the attack. Well, now, for more on the accidental bombing in Nigeria, I'm joined by Mahmoud Halalo. He's a reporter for VOA's House of Service. Welcome, Mohamed. Thank Mahmoud. you, Vincent. Thank yes. you. Now, we, we hear this. First, there's kind of, we needed some clarity here. Was it a, uh, just a civilian area, like a village, or was, was it actually a camp? Uh, you know, uh, Vincent, uh, such places where the IDPs are kept yeah. are places that are very close to some pockets of villages where there are civilian population. Yeah. So it's not surprising that uh, there are two different reactions from different groups saying that it's actually targeted. I mean, the airstrikes uh, hit the IDP camp, mm -hmm. while others are saying uh, it's a civilian population. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are lots of uh, villages around the uh, Iran area, yeah. which could be very close to the camp where these IDPs are. Yeah. And in the mix of all this, it somehow, you know, uh, both parties got entangled. That's the IDPs and the, uh, the civilian population. Now, what are you hearing? Is it that the military, the, the bombers, thought that entire region or that entire camp was like a, a camp for Boko Haram? Or what did they think they were bombing? You know, Vincent, just like uh, pundits are saying, uh, there is some kind of a sense of urgency on the side of the military. Mm -hmm. You know, of recent, they just uh, they displaced the Boko Haram members from their camp in Sambisa. This sense of urgency makes the military uh, people to quickly see that these insurgents don't regroup again. Uh, a lot of people believe that this is one of the reasons why uh, this uh, accidental uh, airstrike happened, uh, because the military think uh, there are some uh, Boko Haram members within these areas, or even within uh, the, the IDPs hiding uh, among them. But then, like you did mention in your intro, you know, they must have sent some uh, kind of activity yeah. because it's a border with Cameroon, this run village where this incident happened. So definitely they might mistakenly uh, took the civilians or the IDPs as the Boko Haram members just like decided uh, they saw some activities going on there. What has been the reaction by civilians and by other Nigerians? Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, this thing uh, is happening, Vincent, because a lot of people, there are lots of reactions coming in from Nigeria, even from neighboring Niger and other lectured basin area where this uh, uh, issue is happening. For one, people think, how could have the military allow such thing to happen? Aren't there rules of engagement in military activities? But you know, like the, uh, the, the, the military said, this is something that can happen even in developed countries. Uh, 
where you see war going on and uh, you see airstrikes affecting uh, civilians. But it's not really a good reaction coupled with the fact uh, that these people fled away from their homes to avoid the insurgents' uh, activities, no, but yet they ended up being hit by an airstrike, which led to lots of uh, uh, lives being lost. We started off by mentioning it, about 50 people killed. Uh, what are you hearing? What are the latest numbers? And uh, Vincent, that is another angle which I fault the Nigerian government. There is a missing link about how many is the death toll. What, what is the death toll for this uh, accidental uh, yes, right. The military is saying, I mean, the MSF, that is Doctors Without Borders, yeah. are saying that the number is 52. Some are saying it's above 100. Mm -hmm. But yet, the Nigerian government are still quiet about the figure. What yeah. is the death toll? People need to know. Yeah. This is a, a kind of, it's going to be a, a way to measure the magnitude of this, uh, this airstrike. So definitely, the Nigerian government needs to come out and say, this is the death toll we have yeah. over these airstrikes. OK. Mm. All right. So uh, you know, we thank you very much for your reporting. And uh, we'll keep uh, just you know, listening mm. and watching to find out more what thank happens. Mahmoud. Thank you. We appreciate it very My much. My pleasure. Now, uh, Mahmoud uh, Lalo is a reporter with VOA's House of Service. Thank you very much. Now, the political turmoil is growing in Gambia. The nation's parliament uh, passed a resolution on Wednesday to allow President Yahya Jame, who lost an election in December, to extend his stay in office for three months. In a broadcast statement on state-run television Tuesday, Jame said the state of emergency will last until the Supreme Court decides and a complaint his political party filed a week after the election, citing voting irregularities. The West African regional bloc, ECOWAS, has placed its military force on standby if Jame does not uh, step down on Thursday when his term is set to expire. The growing threat of violence prompted thousands of Gambians to flee their homeland for neighboring Senegal. So we, for him, obviously, we are pleading to him as concerned Gambian, if he really loves the nation, like he said, he should just simply go and then give Gambians peace. Well, Gambia's Supreme Court was expected to rule on Jame's petition January the 10th, but it postponed the ruling until May because it was unsure a peaceful political transition would take place. Now, for more perspective on the situation in Gambia, uh, Pa Nderimbai is a founder of Pa and publisher uh, of um, uh, the Freedom newspaper online. He joins us uh, via Skype from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Pa Welcome to Africa 54. And uh, my first question to you is, uh, you know, this latest development, do they have any consequences as far as uh, uh, tomorrow is concerned, the extension by parliament of the president's term? Uh, thank you, Vincent. Um, currently, there is a problem in the country. Uh, almost everyone is fleeing. Uh, tourists are living in large numbers in the Gambia. Uh, tonight, midnight, Jamme's term is going to expire. And uh, based on the information we're receiving right now, there is heightened security alert in the country. Uh, the army is divided, and Jamme is banking on the army to floss any possible invasion uh, coming from ECOWAS. From what you're hearing, is there any, like, uh, military... Uh Preparation by Mr. Jame himself, like has anybody seen evidence of troops perhaps marshalling around the, the border with Senegal, whichever side? We know it is literally inside Senegal. Is there any such military preparations? Yes, uh, troops are stationed along the border. And as we speak, there are also troops within the barracks. Uh, almost all the troops are confined to barracks. Uh, there is no movement of soldiers in the streets. Uh, people are staying home, and uh, the streets are completely deserted. Banjul is a ghost town tonight. Well, the ECOWAS said they will have uh, Mr. Adama Barrow inaugurated tomorrow. How realistic is this? Uh, are there any arrangements, any preparations within the country for his inauguration? That's the million-dollar question, Vincent. Um, ECOWAS is saying that Mr. Barrow is going to be inaugurated. But the question is whether Mr. Barrow will enter Banjul tonight. Uh, there is no indication that Jami will back down. Uh, his security forces are on standby. On the, uh, Senegal is also saying that 
uh, come rain, come shine, Mr. Barrow will be inaugurated on Thursday. So we are hoping that by midnight, uh, something will happen. Uh, people are really, really worried. They don't know what's going to happen in coming hours. There is fear, there is pandemonium in the country. Uh, Mr. Jame last night extended his time for another 90 days. Uh, parliament gave him that backing. But there are some constitutional issues surrounding that um, extension. Some political analysts are saying that uh, Jame doesn't have the legal mandate to declare a state of emergency, uh, given the timeline of the extension. Mm -hmm. Uh, constitutionally, JAMA is required to at least issue a gasset. It should be gasseted for two or three days before he can declare a state of mm -hmm. emergency. But under the circumstance, JAMA is not okay. following constitutional prohibition. Well, well, we'll keep watching. It's just a matter of hours. Uh, Pandere, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Vincent. Well, Pandere Mbai is the founder and publisher of the Freedom newspaper, an online newspaper. Now, two days before the inauguration of a new U.S. president, questions persist about his relationship with Russia. His criticism of the European Union and NATO drew an irritated response from German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Viewers Ladi Tsahok reports. Trump has hinted that U.S. sanctions imposed on Russia for its annexation of Crimea could be eased in return for a deal to reduce nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, he has criticized Germany for opening Europe's borders to refugees from Muslim countries and has praised Britain for leaving the European Union. Trump has described the 70-year-old Western military alliance, NATO, as obsolete and has vowed to block a key trade agreement with Europe. Such remarks have sparked consternation among European as well as American politicians. I don't know where the new administration is going, but my message to my friends in Europe, and they are friends, my message is Europe's got to believe in itself. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, the outgoing U.S. Secretary of State said it would be wrong to blame international trade for the loss of jobs. He said the new U.S. administration will inherit a strong economy due to the past eight years of efforts to engage with other countries. Also at the forum, a Trump aide made an attempt to explain his boss. I can more or less say that he has a tremendous amount of respect for Chancellor Angela Merkel. Tremendous amount of respect for her. He has a tremendous amount of respect for President Putin and whatever the issues are that he has to deal with in his own country. He also denied that Trump wants to block international trade. President Trump could be one of the last great hopes for globalism because he's focused on something that we have to fix internally to the United States in order to create a more burgeoning market. In Moscow Tuesday, President Putin slammed reports that Trump hired local prostitutes while on business in Russia. The fact that such methods are being used against the U.S. president-elect is a unique case. Nothing like this has happened before. This shows a significant level of degradation of the political elite in the West, including the United States. Putin said he has never met the U.S. president-elect and has no interest in either defending him or attacking him. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, as President Barack Obama prepares to leave the White House, both critics and supporters agreed that his foreign policy record is mixed, ranging from the killing of Os uh, al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden to impotence in the face of turmoil and violence in many parts of the world, including the Middle East. Most experts also agree that it's, uh, difficult, it's difficult to predict what kind of impact President-elect Donald Trump will have on Obama's legacy on the world stage. Here's VOA with uh, White House correspondent Cindy Sane. President Barack Obama has faced a lot of tough questions about the inability of the U.S. to stop the carnage in Syria, as he did at this news conference in December. For years, we've worked to stop the civil war in Syria and alle alleviate human suffering. It has been one of the hardest issues that I've faced as president. Responsibility for this brutality lies in one place alone, with the Assad regime and its allies, Russia and Iran. And this blood and these atrocities are on their hands. Obama takes credit for ending the combat role for U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, as he vowed to do during his campaign. At least one analyst gives him credit for dealing with a dire situation he inherited from the Bush administration. The world was very much in turmoil. And he took a situation where we were embroiled in Iraq and Afghanistan 
uh, with no end in sight to those wars, and he brought them to an end in terms of U.S. Uh, military involvement and large, a uh, large presence of U.S. troops. Other analysts disagree, saying Obama is leaving the world less secure than he found it. I think there's no question that there is concern about American withdrawal from the world, um, American seeming inattention, lack of focus, and, and lack of, of, of commitment and engagement. I, uh, I think that's true. I, I see it a lot in the Middle East. I hear it from Europeans. I, I see it in Asia as well. Trump. President Obama and uh, President-elect Trump already have clashed over a number of foreign policy Some issues, including issues. Russian interference in the U.S. election, the Iran nuclear deal, how to approach China, and whether or not to close the U.S. detention center at Guantanamo. Obama told reporters he has this advice for his successor. What I've advised the president-elect is that across the board on foreign policy, you want to make sure that you're doing it in a systematic, deliberate, intentional way. He should want his team to be fully briefed on what's gone on in the past and uh, where the, the potential uh, pitfalls may be. But Trump appears to be forging his own course in early meetings with other world leaders ahead of becoming commander-in-chief on January 20th. Cindy Sane, VOA News, the White House. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, Nigeria fails to secure international lending. Stay with us. I am Sheka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Well, in Wednesday's business news, Nigeria fails to secure international lending because it is lacking formal economic uh, reform plans. With more details and what it means for the economy, Africa 54's business correspondent Jill Malandrino reports from the Nasdaq market side. Nigeria's efforts to secure funds from international lenders have stalled because it has not submitted the required economic reform plans, according to one of the banks and sources close to the matter, as reported by Reuters on Tuesday afternoon. The country, which relies on oil revenue for most of its income, has been hit hard by the sharp fall in crude prices since 2014 and is struggling to drag itself out of its first recession in 25 years. Now, the Naira has also failed to stabilize and inflation is in double digits as domestic policy has not yet adjusted to the commodity crash. Nigeria has said to seek $4 billion in loans in total from the World Bank and other foreign institutions and $1 billion through euro bonds to get the deficit under control and fund badly needed infrastructure projects. Nigerian finance minister and the World Bank declined to comment on this issue. The African Development Bank, meanwhile, is holding back the second tranche of a $1 billion loan for Nigeria, the president told Reuters on the sidelines, this is the president of the African Development Bank. He mentioned this at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, going on this week. It's unclear why the government has not submitted reform plans to international lenders. The funding deadlock could throw into doubt badly needed infrastructure projects planned for this year, including new roads and improvements to power and infrastructure plants. Now, President Buhari and his administration have been tasked with fixing mismanagement that started long before he came into office in 2015. Just because crude oil was trading at record highs in 2014, it does not mean the economy was top notch. And that's really what the difference is between what happened in 2014 with commodity prices and the economy that he's trying to fix now. From NASDAQ market site, I'm Jill Melandrino, and this is Africa 54 Business News. Well, it's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54, a journey through time at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. We'll be right back.
mode. This country, the way it's going now, people are not smiling. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Giorgio Armani continued a recent tradition of inviting up-and-coming designers to preview their collections in his Milan theater. This time around, uh, the choices were all Asian designers. The looks incorporated silhouettes inspired by traditional samurai robes, long overcoats, oversized accessories, and even barely their undergarments. Now, the head of the Italian fashion chamber says Armani wanted to give the runway show a sign of internationality. While controversial designs are also creating buzz in Australia, the Australian capital Canberra is home to scores of weird, wonderful and sometimes eyebrow-raising pieces of public art. From giant orange moths to little men reading, art has changed the urban landscape. The capital's connection with art began a decade ago under the then Chief Minister of the Australian Capital Territory. Now, there are over 100 pieces of public funded art. The private sector has now taken the reins with acquiring sculptures, ensuring Canberra's art collection can continue to grow. Well, finally, Fari competitors get ready for a super event. Over 80 puppies from 34 shelters and rescue groups around the U.S. were brought to New York for the two-day taping of the annual Puppy Ball. The Super Bowl for animal lovers, a new element for 2017, was the use of three special needs dogs, including a hearing and sight impaired Australian Shepherd, a deaf English Pointer, and a Terrier born with three legs. And now the game, which always celebrates adoption awareness, will air on February 5th, uh, starting 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And now, and will repeat all day and night. And that is what is trending today. Well, America's newest museum, and perhaps it is its most awaited, has hosted thousands of visitors since it opened last year. People from around the world are flocking to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. VOA was given special access to the massive facility. Africa 54's Haiti Adams Fitz, uh, Fitzpatrick takes us on this very fascinating walk through time. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we are not the makers of history, we are made by history. We're here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. This building, 100 years in the making, was designed by David Ajaye, an architect with East African roots. But he says he was inspired by the people of West Africa when he designed this building. We're going to take you inside where we will meet John Franklin. He's the director of international programs here at the museum. He's about to take us on a remarkable journey and show us the stories that have made the experience of Africans in America so extraordinary. The museum in great detail chronologically explores the complex story of slavery and freedom. John Franklin, the museum's director of international programs, specializes in the history and traditions of the African diaspora. He says the stories of slavery require the unvarnished truth. The premise of the museum is that you're looking at American history and culture through an African-American perspective and an African-American lens. The journey of slavery in America begins in Africa, where people were snatched from their homes for the brutal transatlantic slave trade. Many, many, many people from all of these regions were taken uh, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions. We estimate 12 and a half million being brought across the Atlantic between 1500 and 1867. Only 5% of those come to the United States. Approximately a million go to Jamaica, a million to Haiti, a million to Cuba, six million to Brazil. But how captured Africans were taken to the Americas tells its own horrific tale. The imagery is powerful. 
seeing the actual whips and shackles that we use to imprison Africans and traffic them to slavery in the New World. Here you have the kind of restraints that were used for adults at the bottom and for children at the top. See, those are for very little hands. In this exhibit, a great irony about the founding of the United States is laid bare. So on the back wall here, you have all of the documents founding America, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. So we have Thomas Jefferson here, who's known for having written the Declaration of Independence, but having been a slave owner as well. So he is promoting freedom, but being a slave owner. And behind him, you'll see bricks with the names of some of the 600 people he owned during the course of his life. The global movement to abolish slavery did not end black exploitation in America. When the trade ends and you cannot bring any new Africans here, the Africans who are already here then become valuable to help build and develop other parts of the country. 35,000 artifacts from around the world were collected for this museum. Here, an auction block where slaves stood to be bought and sold. Nat Turner's Bible, he led a slave rebellion in 1831. And Harriet Tubman Shaw, a former slave herself, Tubman ushered others to freedom on harrowing missions from safe house to safe house on the so-called Underground Railroad. America's economy and its capital were built in part on the backs of African slaves. Where we're standing were plantations before this was decided to be created as the city of Washington. And then the prominent, prominent buildings of the city are built with slave labor. The Capitol uh, and the White House are among those. It took a civil war to bring this chapter of American history to a close. U.S. President Abraham Lincoln declared the slaves to be free in the rebelling states, and Congress amended the Constitution to outlaw slavery and ensure that Africans in America could stay. Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick, VOA News, Washington. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Vincent McCory from Africa 54. This is VOA. Follow us on Africa 54. Go to facebook.com slash VOA Africa 54. Welcome to English in a Minute. You have probably heard of to-do lists. When going to a store, you might make a shopping list. But what is a bucket list? Let's listen as Jonathan and Anna explain. Bucket list. Guess what I'm finally doing this weekend? Skydiving. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, it's been on my bucket list for years, so I'm finally going to do it. I have a few things on my bucket list too, but um, jumping out of a plane is not one of them. A bucket list is a list of things you want to do before you die. You can put anything on your bucket list. Writing a book, traveling overseas, or in that daredevil Anna's case, skydiving. And that's English in a Minute.